Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Great to see you again. Uh, thanks for coming out on this very windy day. And um, hello again to all of you. If you don't know me, if we haven't been introduced, my name is Brian Uzi. I'm one of the co-directors here at NICO. And uh, my other co-director, Danny Abrams, is right here. Danny's going to say a word in a minute. Uh, there's a couple of things I wanted to talk about. Every year, people grow, we move on, we expand. And uh, we've had a few personnel changes. And I want to draw attention to a few people who have done tremendous things for NICO and deserve recognition for it as they move on to other areas in their lives. One is Alana Lazarovich. She's sitting right over there. You've probably seen her over the years. Alana was our associate director for a couple of years, really helped build NICO. She brought in outside money with grants, made connections with industry, got us access to data sets. I had the distinct pleasure and honor of working with her at Kellogg for about eight years straight in a very close partnership where our job was to bring AI into the DNA of Kellogg. And uh, one of the consequences of that is this guy right here, Dashun Wang, we were able to hire him and Hai Jin Yoon and uh, build a whole palette of courses that have really been great in helping Kellogg stay on the frontier of knowledge in that area. With that said, uh, Alana, I'd like you to just come to the front of the room. I got a little something for you um, for all the years of service. So thank you so much. And I should tell you that Alana is moved into a new position on campus. She's now doing development for Kellogg in our executive development center, basically building business uh, for Kellogg. So thank you so much. It's been awesome. Awesome. I'm glad you're not going away. It's too far. It's really been super. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Alana. Now, the other person who I really want to recognize and thank is Luis Amarel, who was my co-director here at, North, uh, at NICO for seven years. If you don't know it, NICO is governed by two schools at the university equally, McCormick and Kellogg. And that's why we have two co-directors. One is from Kellogg from McCormick, and Luis was the McCormick uh, co-director for the last seven years. And the Luis, unfortunately, is double booked, but all of this is on film for him, so he's going to get a chance to see it. And uh, I just want to say Luis uh, just did, has done so much, so much for Nico, and really so much for the whole university. And if you haven't had a chance to, you know, go to his webpage, look at his research and the things he's done for, Kel uh, for all of Northwestern, it has really been above and beyond what you see happening most any place you go. At NICO, for instance, he developed the boot camp that occurs in the fall that like really gives people an opportunity to get into computational sciences early. And I don't just mean people from the med school, people from engineering, you know, people from like English literature and Russian studies who want to learn natural language processing come to that boot camp. He's also been an innovative in um, our Friday, Friday, the data science nights, thank you. Is that a Friday? No, the data science nights. That was also one of Luis's brainchild. And of course, most recently, on top of all the money that he's brought in up to this point, he and Adam are able to bring in another seven million, more than that, to a project they're doing on law. So, uh, even though Luis is not here, let's give him a really giant hand uh, and applause for everything he's done. Luis, thank you so, so much. Luis, I also got something for you. I can't open it and I can't tell you what it is, but I like it for a lot of different reasons. It's, well, it's one piece of injected molded aluminum, so there's no edges, okay? It's all smooth. Looks really great with Apple stuff. It's silver, so he's going to really like it. Um, it's functional. It does something that would be really good for him. It's kind of heavy, so it feels expensive. And um, finally, it's got a special meaning uh, for him and I to remember all the good times we had together. So thank you, Luis. And one last quick announcement is going to come from Danny. Danny is already concerned about eating YY's time, but he does just want to say a couple of things. Danny is standing up right there. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. I, in the interest of not taking up all of YY's time here, I want to just say uh, 
For those of you who don't, don't know me, I'm Danny Abrams. I'm a professor of applied math in the engineering school. But my research is really complex systems, and I've been an enthusiastic member of NICO since I got here. And I'm, I want to echo everything that Brian said about how great a uh, position Nico is in, thanks to Luis and thanks to Alana. So um, I'm looking forward to keeping, keeping the momentum and keeping Nico improving and growing for the next several years. So with that, uh, why don't we let YY take over and, uh, and hear about his talk, is, which I'm sure is gonna be exciting. I have seen him talk before, so I know it's gonna be good. Thanks, YY, welcome. Well, go ahead. I'm going to keep this unbelievably brief as the actual introduction. <laughs> I know there's too many of us. Uh, please, let's welcome Professor YY On from Indiana University, Bloomington. He is a consummate complex systems researcher. You have to love the publication profile when anyone has publications in science, Lancet, PRL, nature, human behavior covering everything from social systems to biological systems and medicine. Uh, so please, let's welcome Professor YY and let him hit the stage finally. Okay, uh, thank you so much for very kind introduction. And it's always like such a pleasure to be at NICO and seeing friends and uh, colleagues here. So yeah. Thank you very much. So uh, today I'll talk about uh, knowledge systems, especially those systems built on citations. So uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, my colleagues, Tadamori Kozaku and Robert Mahari. These two young researchers were those who done all the heavy lifting of the project and they're amazing. So if you have a chance, hire them. Uh, yeah, so let me ask a simple question, like how do we humans accumulate knowledge, right? Um, we can go back to this old oral tradition. Like at the beginning, we were just talking to people and sharing this communal knowledge with, the, with each other. But then that become kind of more of a concrete written knowledge. Uh, sometimes in this type of plate and in books and so on. But then an uh, interesting thing happens, which is the knowledge become more kind of personalized. It's not communal anymore. Like this is uh, one of the oldest books uh, from China, the Analect. And this book is about the teaching of uh, Confucius. It's uh, it, his individual teaching. And now we are in a situation where things can build on and fight each other and evolve and build on top and so on. So what I want to say is a uh, citation is basically saying that, oh, this person said something or that book said something. That's a really fundamental way to build our knowledge on top of existing knowledge. And that's why I think in science, we are using citations to build our knowledge on top of the shoulders of the previous giants. And <clears throat> if you think about uh, knowledge in, in more general way, not just thinking about the science, there are certain types of knowledge that are really useful for human, for instance, one well, of the most important knowledge is like how not get killed. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be either by a bear or falling trees. A lot of like natural uh, knowledge about the nature is about how not to die. <laughs> and also um, we need to think about our society because anybody can kill me. <laughs> I mean, it's a little bit pessimistic view, but the human survival is like really hinged upon our understanding of the nature as well as our society. We need to be able to regulate human behaviors. And also 
other types of knowledge is like how can do certain things better? How can we make this tool better? Right. So what I'm getting at with this three question is um, these three types of knowledge, like it's uh, really the bedrock of human knowledge, and they are represented by these three systems. The uh, law is about how to regulate ourselves, how to make rules so that we can live together. Science is about understanding the nature and how things work. And then patents is a technology we have, how to make tools better, how to measure things better, and so on. So these three systems represent like really the fundamental knowledge system we have. And as you know, they are all built on citations, right? So it's a knowledge as uh, uh, citation-based knowledge systems. So yeah, so how do we collectively cite and build on this existing knowledge? And that has been the topic of study by many scholars, uh, including many of you sitting here. And this has been like one of the interesting questions about the science of science. Like how, what's, what's the dynamics of the citation? And you may say, oh, we know a lot, of, a lot about this science as a knowledge system. We know that it's growing exponentially. It doesn't seem to stop <laughs> somehow. And um, we know about this preferential attachment that produce these uh, heavy tails of citations. And then we also know about this forgetting behaviors. We forget old knowledge and we tend to pay attention more to the more recent knowledge. And then there are interesting things like a random impact rule where you can publish your most cited paper at any moment in your career and so on. But there are a lot of patterns we have found uh, by we, I mean, the, the collection of scientists found about how knowledge uh, system work. And one of the kind of the most succinct summary of this knowledge is this model by uh, Dashun right here. Um, so this kind of summarize uh, some of the most important pattern in citation dynamics, which is that um, the citation a paper receives is proportional to the fitness of the paper, how good the paper is and how important the paper is. So we are assuming some inherent quality of the, of the publication. And then we have existing citation of that paper. So that signals as signifies this a preferential attachment. And uh, this can come from many different mechanisms, but all in all, it kind of aggregate into the preferential attachment phenomenon. And then aging. We pay attention to more recent publication because they tend to be more relevant to us. And then this, pro this model kind of produced this uh, citation dynamics that goes up and goes down over time where if you look at time as a log scale, and then many papers follow this uh, universal dynamics. That's really cool. <laughs> um, but, but my question is, are they universal across this citation-based knowledge system? Uh, we have looked at science, but maybe to some extent patent, uh, technological system, but how about other systems? Can we say this is a universal dynamics that happen in any citation-based knowledge system? Or is it specific to science? So that's the question uh, we asked uh, in our project. And uh, I was really happy to come up with this <laughs> name uh, of our project. Uh, and we sat down together and thought about like how similar or different the systems are. And we found quite interesting contrasts between these systems. For instance, 
uh, legal system, we are looking at the US case law and federal judges. And here, the judges are appointed by the politicians. And there's a limited number of judges who are serving on federal court, right? It's not like a science or technology where you can just publish if you have a good paper. You need to be on the bench of federal court to be able to publish any legal opinions. So there's a really strict rule about who can or who cannot publish. And other interesting distinction is that um, in science, we are largely, we have, we have our agency. We can choose what to work on and what to publish to some extent. Uh, but in the case of the uh, legal system, you cannot choose it. You are assigned to a case more or less randomly. So you don't choose what to work on. That's like really big difference, right? And then if you look at also like hierarchy, um, I mean, science is somewhat hierarchical. We have a strong prestige differential between universities, for instance, and high, high prestige university, they tend to publish papers that get cited by everyone and so on. So there's some hierarchy, but it's not as strong as uh, legal systems. So in legal system, you have a Supreme Court and then appeal court and then district court. And each court is bounded by the higher court. If Supreme Court says something, that's the bounding opinion. You cannot reverse it. Okay, so there is a really strong hierarchical structure. And then uh, number of authors, for instance, science, we know that um, the population of scientists has been growing like exponentially and um, so on. But in terms of judges, number of judges are limited. It doesn't really grow. Uh, do you have a question? No? Okay. Yeah, and another interesting difference is that in patent, patents have a different types of citation. And one type of citation, you have some little bit of perverse incentive not to cite the most relevant paper because your patent application can be rejected if there's something too similar to your application. So there are a lot of similarity, but also like striking differences between those systems. So the question is, do we expect the same citation dynamics. So uh, we decide to measure. We use APS because a lot of those uh, dynamics are already known and replicated in across many systems. So we chose one system, a small, fairly small uh, data set. And we use patent view. And then uh, we use the Harvard Law School's case law access project. And because you may be more familiar with science and technology, uh, let me first talk a little bit about how the legal system works. Um, I'm not a legal scholar, but one of our co-author is a lawyer and med uh, law school student. So I learned a lot from him. <laughs> so legal citation in the US uh, is a common law system. So Basically, we have a codes that Congress passes, but then there's a case law, which is a body of law created by the judges through written opinions. So if one judge publish, they say at the Supreme Court, one ju uh, the judges publish a judicial opinion, that become a case law. And then following uh, decisions will be made based on the body of those case laws. Uh, pre uh, published previously. And then each of the publication is called judicial opinion, which is a written decision that explain why judge uh, came to that conclusion. Okay. And uh, there was a really interesting case, uh, an example. There was a case called a chaotic convention case. Uh, and there was a convention in a hotel, but somehow there was a mule was stable in the lobby 
and then there was an alligator, guns were fired, and then eventually something fall, and then a passerby got hurt by this falling object. So the case, case was about whether the hot hotel is liable for that injury or not. And it turns out that hotel was aware of this danger when they granted this uh, convention, the hotel is liable. And that become the basis of all the decisions about like how hotel want to avoid holding a conference like this. <laughs> okay. And also a uh, legal system in the US has a this binding uh, precedent rules. So we have a Supreme Court, appellate court, and district court. If Supreme Court says something that all the court below should follow that. And then there is a, also horizontal precedent. Court is bound by its own opinion and by own like district essentially. Yeah. So it's very strict. Yeah, so uh, to again, highlight some of the really big differences um, in law, there's a codified like explicit bounding hierarchy. And then in law, there's a randomly assigned problems to the judges instead of like uh, personal choices. And then the number of judges is uh, really limited and it's not growing exponentially. And judges immediately get tenure. It's awesome <laughs> for judges. Uh, so you don't need to worry about once you get into the federal court. There's no incentive to write grant. There is like the incentives are very different for the judges and so on. Um, so are they similar? Uh, if they weren't similar, I'm not giving a talk here. <laughs> uh, so interestingly, as I said, in legal system, the number of judges are limited, but still the number of opinions published has been growing exponentially. Uh, and same thing for science and patents. Yeah, so we have exponential growth of publications, cit citations, and so on. Uh, the distribution, nice uh, straight line. <laughs> if you measure preferential attachment, it's a clear preferential attachment across three systems. If you measure recency, uh, you have the same recency curve, more or less. And even random impact rule and Q factor hold. So as I said, judges are assigned randomly to cases, but still you can see some judges with high Q factor, low Q factor, and they tend to produce kind of similar level of citations. And then there's a random impact rule as well. So a judge's opinion may get the most cited opinions of that judge in any time in their career, more or less. Same for inventors and scientists. Yeah, so it seems like <laughs> citation dynamics is fairly universal. Um, and that's interesting. That means these stark differences doesn't really matter, right? Like number of judges, number of scientists, maybe that's not the most important thing that drives these dynamics. Uh, whether you are assigned to problems versus you are choosing your problems, maybe that, that's not that important. Our funding system, maybe it doesn't matter. <laughs> So there is a really kind of strong universality kind of coming out of despite of these differences. Yeah, so the question is like, this model is the model that explain every system. Um, but sorry for that. <laughs> uh, there's one thing that this model doesn't really explain well which is so-called uh, Sleeping Beauty or Diamond in the Rough, which is, uh, which is a phenomenon describing 
papers that doesn't get any citation for like decades. And then you suddenly get thousands of citations and become like super highly cited papers. And interestingly, um, this has been found in science and it happens amazingly. So your papers that has not been cited, they may, be, they may have a future in several decades. So don't, don't lose your hope <laughs> for your publications. And you can see those publication across three systems. So uh, in legal system, judicial opinions, there are some opinions that doesn't get cited and then suddenly get cited a lot. Uh, in patent, there are patents that doesn't get cited for a while and then cited like thousands of times. But this is a really uh, hard to explain using this, the citation model. Okay, here's an example of uh, delayed recognition in law. Uh, this case was uh, 1982 and no citation until 2002 and then cited like a thousand times suddenly. And what's happening in this case is uh, interesting because it's a kind of method, method opinion where judges can use it to dismiss the case without much writing much. So it, it's a kind of a way to quickly dismiss a case. So somehow the, people found this uh, kind of loophole and used it a lot and then uh, it doesn't get used anymore now. So it's an interesting case. Yeah, so we were wondering, yes. Has there been a change uh, recently with using search engines for law, for example, versus people who had to go on the law books? Yeah, yeah. So that's really interesting question. And there has been uh, debates, especially in science, like how search engines and information technology changed the way uh, we cite, um, I will say on the kind of broad scheme of things, the general statistical pattern has not changed much, but there is uh, some measurable kind of changes in interesting ways. Like for instance, some argue uh, the literature has been narrowing in a sense that the more citation goes to the top papers and then if you don't get cited a lot in the beginning, you basically got forgotten. Um, yeah, but it's like really hard to disentangle because there is exponential growth of the publications and that confounds so many different things. Yeah, but it's a really good question. Yeah, so we were thinking about like how to explain this phenomenon. Um, if you focus on individual paper, and this paper must have a high fitness value given that this gets cited so much, but how you stay dormant for such a long time. It's really hard to wrap our head around this phenomenon. And, um, and Laszlo mentioned one thing and that kind of really is at the heart of our approach, our model which was that performance is about you, how, what you are doing and how you are doing. But success, however, is about us, how we recognize you, your performance. So what we were thinking about is that maybe the citation models are too focused on individual papers. It, it just completely ignores us part. So can we kind of incorporate us into the model? So if you think about citation as a success, um, is it enough to only focus on the paper, like single individual paper, without considering the community that recognize that paper? And shouldn't the citation dynamics be inherently collective dynamics, not individual dynamics. So that's like really the driving force of our model. 
So we came up with a model called collective citation model. Um, and the idea is somewhat simple, which is instead of thinking about papers only, we are thinking about the scientific community or legal community or communities of inventors and how they have recognized. And other kind of inspiration was um, kind of our, uh, another, another stream of work that we have been doing, try to map the space of knowledge. And that inspired us to think about what if we, we model the whole space of knowledge all at the same time, instead of thinking about one paper. Yeah, so, and this kind of shift in perspective allow us to explain a lot of different phenomena. Like for instance, now we are thinking about not just one paper, but like how people are moving, right? So if there was a, it's a dislocation in this space and a paper appeared. And then if the community moved toward that direction, and it will get cited more because there are more papers popping up around it. And then they will cite, like, more likely to cite it. So that explains how uh, paper get picked up and how kind of the fashion in science works. If there is a hype, people move it, and then you get more citation and so on. And if somehow paper appeared out of nowhere, maybe this paper was like, too early, uh, maybe like several decades early, then it will not get any citation because no one is working on that topic. But eventually by just the uh, randomness, the community may move toward that direction and may discover that paper. And then the paper get, can get cited suddenly and a lot. And also, uh, maybe we can also think about the process of producing a new paper, new papers, by just thinking about, oh, we already have this space of existing papers. We need to start from somewhere. And most likely, most simplest model can be take a paper and then put another paper around it. So these are kind of conceptual idea behind this model. Uh, so this is our collective citation model. So the conditional probability that paper I cite J is depending on the fitness of paper J. Okay. And then we have a preferential attachment dynamics. So if the paper has more citation, then we are more likely to cite it. And then we have aging kernel. But uh, instead of using a uh, different aging function for each paper, we used just the one universal aging function um, in a way that we human have more or less one curve for aging or kind of decaying of um, um, attention to papers. Yeah. And then we have this extra ingredient which is uh, the location of the paper. So we are imagining this hypersphere that capture the space of possible knowledge and then paper exists on that space. And then if paper, two papers are really uh, close to each other, then this new paper may cite the other paper um, more likely. So this is our model and you can kind of imagine this big hypersphere uh, and new paper sites based on these four different factors. Fitness, citation, distance, and aging. Any question about the model here? Yes. Uh, Z is a normalization factor to make it probability, yeah. Yeah, uh, it's a really good question. So in, in our model, we fit the embedding vector to explain 
existing citation in our training data set. Yeah, so embedding comes out of a citation network. But, but it's true that we can use uh, basically text analysis to come up with embedding and then fix that uh, and fit only the rest as possible. No, 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 embedding is learned from existing citation. So this is a generative model. And then we have citation, uh, the realization of citation network. So we infer embedding space. Yeah. Any other question? Yes. Uh, it's fixed. We tried different dimensions. It tend to not so sensitive as long as as long as it as long as it has some dimensions like four, eight, or something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is the model, and uh, this embedding space is kind of byproduct of the model. Uh, so by by learning, like by predicting how our new paper site, existing paper, we kind of learn how embedding space is organized. So basically this space reflect how publications cite each other. Okay. And this is a science and there's a fairly clear kind of topical clusters. If you look at PAX code, for instance, they're organized based on those PAX code. Um, patent is similar, but it's all a little bit more intermixed. We are wondering whether this is uh, this reflect the patent uh, is less disciplinary. It, it may use more of a different knowledge from different area of uh, space. The law is a little bit more different because it reflects a lot of uh, this hierarchy, hierarchical structure. There is a Supreme Court cluster where Supreme Court cases cite each other, uh, for instance. And there is a district structure also kind of uh, coming out of the, this embedding. So uh, basically this is a kind of, I'm thinking of as a byproduct of the model where we can use it to um, understand and review what kind of organizing principle is behind this citation dynamics? Like what kind of, is it topic one matters? Or is it like hierarchy one matters? So we can probe those questions by just looking at two, this knowledge space. And we tested whether we can uh, predict certain categorical label of a publication by looking at the neighbors in the embedding space. And uh, the higher, the better here. And if you use like small k, small number of neighbors, we can do much better than using citation data, uh, both ways, reference and citation. In other words, this, this embedding tell us about, a lot about like for instance, court hierarchy in law and circuit and tax category and APS data, and then the CPC categories. The embedding really reflect that. Um, it's better than using citation network. And the exciting part is that it also reproduces the sleeping beauties, uh, the distribution of sleeping beauties. In other words, it indeed happens if you just have this model. You tend to have these papers just out there alone until they get discovered and get cited. So this model can produce this uh, tail of sleeping beauties. And then uh, this part up until this point, we just fit the model to get the embedding and the parameters, several parameters we have. But now we can also think about the production dynamics because we are thinking about the, the whole knowledge space and how paper get introduced. Uh, we came up with like really simple model, which is you randomly pick a paper, existing paper, 
and then put a paper, new paper around it, according to some reasonable normal distribution. Um, yeah, so that's the production model. <laughs> and it seemed to work fairly well, given that um, if you find some clusters in the embedding space, and we measure how many papers are in each cluster, then larger cluster with more papers, they tend to get more site, uh, more new papers. So this is our empirical data. And uh, there's a kind of uh, relationship, positive relationship between the number of kind of density of papers in certain field versus how many new papers uh, get produced, which is natural, right? Makes sense. But what this allow us to do is it let us simulate the whole system dynamics from certain time, time point to the future. So given all the papers and citation network we have seen, can we run the simulation of where new paper comes in and how they cite and so on. So can we kind of create future citation network? Yeah. And it turns out that it works pretty well. So we, again, we stop with a certain time point, like 2000, and we have all the empirical data and we know their location because we fit, fit it the model. And starting from there, we introduce new papers based on existing density of papers. And then we run the rule. We add citation for all these new papers. And then we can make predictions. So given the paper that just appeared, okay, we don't have the data about how this paper gets cited. Can we predict the number of citation this new paper got uh, will get in in the future? And uh, what we see is that um, the higher citation, the paper, the actual citation they have, we tend to be able to predict better better than other models. Um, and also we can we can be much better at predicting top cited papers um, in the future by running this simulation, running the whole knowledge system simulation. Yeah. Any questions? Yes. How do we know that the better prediction comes from the more information coming in, the more parameters? So we kind of like could be overfitting. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's really good point. So we have more parameters. We have embedding essentially. We have locations. Yeah. So it's totally possible that just by adding more parameters, we can better predict. Um, at the same time, our knowledge and at the training kind of sample, right? And then this is a kind of unseen knowledge. And our point is, uh, I say, one of our points is that we need to think about this collective rather than single citation. Uh, so it makes sense that looking at the collective and thinking about more information, more context matters. Yeah. It's, it's uh, somewhat natural to be able to predict better, yes. Um, a question from our online audience. Um, in the last 30 years, patent applications have tended to cite many more references than prior because of a new rule, because of new rules 97 and 98, and because of the doctrine of inequitable, inequitable conduct by which failure to disclose a reference may render the patent unenforceable. Can you comment on whether you have seen that increase in citations and whether there are patterns that are differentially observed under the old and new practices. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, we couldn't see any noticeable uh, change in terms of like gross of references or gross of uh, 
exploitation in patent data. Um, there, it may have affected the citation practice, but it may not be enough to make a big dent in the overall, uh, global trend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think it's a great question. Um, so I think there is a kind of differing level of how how much hierarchy matters in these systems. A like legal system is like codified, super strict. Science is much more informal, right? Much weaker than law. Um, yeah, but the model doesn't have any information about hierarchy in the model. So it just keep producing papers of publication around existing publications, and it just decide to cite based on the parameters, right? So the model is like totally oblivious of the hierarchical structure here. Um, but I think the hierarchy comes into play in terms of like a fitness parameter that we infer. So for instance, Supreme Court decisions may have much higher fitness um, by the model because, because they get cited a lot. Yeah, so uh, we did some studies removing like fitness parameter or aging parameter. And they tend to reproduce most of the patterns, although not as faithfully as the full model. So I don't think there is a really strong um, effect of hierarchical structure. And but another question I want to ask you is: uh, Is it is it even possible to not having any hierarchy in the system? It it'll would it just naturally emerge, even if you start from like totally equal population? Yeah. But the important part is the model doesn't really know hierarchical structure. Yes. Um, so if I understand, if I understood your um, testing task, you're essentially adding a paper near one of the areas in, in the sphere, right? And then try to predict the um, citation that would, it would collect over time. Um, so I was wondering if you try to, so do you have a sense of if you put papers, new papers far from currently defined or embedded clusters or sub-communities, how well would the model then predict? So it's essentially deviating from the incremental addition of new knowledge mm -hmm. moving towards more distant sort of? Yeah, so it's uh, the interesting question. We can uh, change the production rule and see how much that production rule affect the prediction. For instance, we can just put randomly. Instead of picking existing paper, we can put randomly and see whether that diminishes our the model's power, for instance. Yeah, I think that's an interesting idea. Yeah. Um, I had a question, you know, similar to Mo's and then a second question. So if I understand what you did correctly, you did embeddings using citations references. And so you create a neighborhood around any single paper of other papers that are similar in terms of their citation patterns. Um, not then you choose a subset called K of kind of like their closest neighbors. Uh, is, not is that what you did? Not exactly. So the embedding vector itself is learned uh -huh. from the probability probability model that we have. Uh, no. So this is our probability model, mm -hmm. 
And based on this generative model, we infer the parameters, including the embedding vectors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so in the end, after you go through this, you're, you're still creating communities of papers that have similar citation relationships. Uh, in the end, correct? yes. With some additional yes. embedding. Yeah. So like if someone were to, to just try to leave here with like a nugget to think about in a practical sense, it's kind of like if you write a paper that goes into a neighborhood where the average citations is 10 citations per paper, you're likely to get 10 citations for your paper. Is it kind of like that? So you could know as much about a new paper, not by knowing anything about the paper, but just knowing about the friends of that paper. Um, yeah, so that, that adds a lot of information mm -hmm. because uh, if the area is like super populated with uh, recent papers, that means there'll be more future paper will come around mm -hmm. that neighborhood. And if you are in the vicinity, you'll observe yeah. a lot of those population at a citation. Uh -huh. yeah. All right, very interesting. So one other quick question, if I can. Uh, you know, one of the things about this paper that I think is a strength is that it builds on a lot of work on citations. But you know, last year at Dashun's conference, for example, there was a lot of criticisms of the way we've traditionally looked at citations, just counting. And people are looking for other ways to think about citations and their impact. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder, you know, to what degree you might have thought about that as you're thinking about this paper. So you've got like this great, like 5,000 feet in the air, looking at the structure of the citations and counting them. Uh, and, you know, other people want to put weight on some citations versus others, which could change the picture. Yeah. Um, Law, for instance, is they might cite the same at your level, just as an example. But like when you read the law, every citation has got like its own little paragraph <laughs> explaining why that citation fits there, which is something we don't do at all. Um, and then at the Supreme Court, a citation is actually quite consequential for like what you talked about in the beginning, like life and death, yep. uh, women's right to abortion, a whole lot of things. So like, have you thought about thinking about your paper from the lens of how else might we consider citations and their importance for the creation of knowledge? Yeah, that's uh, a really good question. Um, yes, that's a really good question. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So here, the, the embedded space that you learn that from your model, right? So you learn that from the data. My question is how that is correlated with the tax. So if you have the tax, all of the information that can you correlate these two things? So the reason I ask this question, if you have a new paper that can you make a prediction based on them? I think based on this model, you cannot make a prediction, right? For, but if you can correlate with these with the tax, then maybe you can make a prediction based on your model. Yeah, uh, uh, good question. I think it's somewhat related to earlier question. Um, yeah, I think it's, it would be really interesting to compare with other information. Like if, if for instance, text embedding is really similar to the embedding space we learn from citation, and maybe text citation may be a good enough proxy for place a paper into the space we learned, and we may be able to predict fairly well the consequence of uh, the citation, collective citation dynamics. Um, and also it may be really interesting to see the paper where the content and citation embedding is very different. So that can be, that can signal quite interesting papers. For instance, uh, although this paper was about this stuff, it may be some very translational or disruptive in a sense that it get used in other places. Yeah, so very interesting questions. Yes. You know, one of the things that's in the air right now is chat GPT, like everywhere. And so one of the questions people have when they're trying to figure this out is how should that uh, system cite the work that it's cribbing all the time? Like it's the, biggest you know, plagiarism machine in the world. 
What would you say about that? Yeah, uh, another very good question, <laughs> <laughs> which I don't really have answer uh, right now. Yeah, um, I mean, one one interesting thing people have been doing is like uh, is writing, generating fake papers, uh, and get accepted into places, um, and you can in a way think about kind of formulate way to create innovations. Um, maybe like Kajin's work, like for instance, thinking about combinations, combinatorial innovations. Maybe you can just pick these things, ask AI to produce something that mesh these two things up. Um, it can be quite useful tool for us potentially, because that allow us to, how to say, kind of uh, do more intentional targeted exploration. Um, so I think there is a lot of opportunities there, like thinking, uh, I'll, I'll call like computational creativity, like using computational tool to create something that's like really new. That's, I think, one exciting thing to think about. But at the same time, it will create so much BS <laughs> and it will just overwhelm our knowledge systems. So that's, that's another, the other side of it. Like how, like for instance, I mean, I'm pretty sure uh, judges will start using those AI system to write more of a judicial opinions. Uh, I think it's already quite formulaic as, as far as I know. And a lot of writing is a kind of template, templated. But now it can be even more accelerated to write those uh, more template-based writing tasks. So it may continue this exponential growth, which it's uh, hard to comprehend in these systems. Um, yeah, so I don't know, just random, random thoughts. Um, Interesting question. Um, so this model uh, learn the location of the papers and kind of the nature of the paper by uh, by looking into the citation network, right? Um, but if a paper is plagiarized something else, then it may not be. Uh, it may not. How to say? may not manifest into the citation network because I mean, it may not get cited as a poor quality paper that plagiarize other papers. So I think for plagiarizing, I think just text-based tool may work much better uh, because at the end of the day, you are finding the matches. That's the definition of plagiarizing. And there, there was an interesting study by Guillaume Kavanak and he, he studied the cases of this tortured word. Have you heard of the phrase? Yeah, so basically people use like uh, translation services and translation tools to write papers or like computational tools. And they tend to produce like really weird phrases that normal uh, English speaker will, not, will never use. And that, that tend to be a really good signal of uh, something funky going on with the paper. Yeah, so that that can be an AI can be potentially used in those cases where uh, it can maybe find a possible weird tortured phrases.
We'll end with that. We've hit 1 p.m. Let us all thank YY for his exhilarating talk.